I'm a wildlife veterinarian. I've had the privilege of working with the most threatened and endangered species in their natural habitat. I've worked with grizzly bears outside of Yellowstone National Park, with wolverines on the highest peaks of the Rocky Mountains, with elephants in Africa, and with tigers and rhinos in the jungles of Nepal. When I was asked in 2010 to go to Nepal and work on a research project to collar a tiger, I was in the park and I heard of a story. I heard of a story about a tiger who had recently been captured. And that tiger had walked out of the park and it was emaciated and it was weak and he walked into a local village and he collapsed into a hotel lobby. And that tiger was re-released into another park. And if I ask you, let's substitute that tiger. Let's substitute that tiger for a raccoon instead of a tiger. And if I asked you, if that raccoon walked into a hotel lobby or into your home, would you think, there was that habitat encroachment? Was that tiger diseased or that raccoon diseased? And the story is not just tigers alone, it's endangered wildlife. We have some of our critically endangered wildlife have gone down to almost extinction, like black-footed ferrets and wild dogs due to disease, but little work is being done on the ground, in the field, to collect um, and understand for disease and investigate for disease. And, and if we understand disease, then we can actually prevent it and treat it. Conservation work focuses on two main factors, habitat encroachment and poaching. And if I ask most of you about tigers, you might say, wow, they're going towards extinction because of habitat encroachment and poaching. And it's true. Their habitat is shrinking and getting smaller and smaller. And animals are being taken out of the forests. And in fact, in my lifetime, we have seen the populations dwindle. We've seen their natural environment dwindle because of human population. And yet, there may be a missing piece to our conservation. Conservation efforts focuses on these two things, but that missing piece may be wildlife health. Zoos across the world have known and have seen in the past 10 years that endangered wildlife get diseases. In fact, tigers get diseases that your dog gets and your cat gets. And we share diseases with, people, with animals as well. 60% of animals share diseases with us. And there is work being done on wildlife health, but it's how endangered wildlife share, and how wildlife share diseases with humans and with our agricultural animals not how endangered wildlife get diseases. And so if we continue to work in just conservation on these two factors, on habitat encroachment and on poaching, we may be missing a big part of the puzzle. We may not be addressing one factor that is actually causing the decline of our endangered wildlife. And we saw this last year, actually. In Kazakhstan, we saw that 90% of the critically endangered saiga antelope died virtually overnight due to a disease. We are saving conservation pastures, but yet these pastures may be empty. 210 critically endangered saiga antelope died. That's 70% of the total population. And guess what? I've seen this personally. In Montana, as a wildlife veterinarian outside of Yellowstone National Park, I was called off to a bighorn sheep die-off about an hour north of Yellowstone. And we got into the field, and I saw emaciated, staggering bighorn sheep, literally in front of our chuck, peel over and die. And I looked up to the pasture, and I saw a similar scene. I saw bighorn sheep dying or dead in the pasture. What happened was that domestic sheep 
commingled with those wild sheep. And the domestic sheep were healthy, and yet it caused a devastation of the bighorn sheep. 90% of that local herd died, and it's not just in Montana, it's happening all over North America. Bighorn sheep are dying because of diseases that they get from, from domestic sheep. Let me give you a human perspective. When the settlers came to North America, they brought with them diseases like smallpox, tuberculosis. And when they commingled with Native American population, it wiped out the Native Americans. 95% of the population died due to disease. This could be happening with our wildlife, and yet little work is being done in order to protect and to look at disease in our wildlife. So back in Nepal. Nepal is a small country. It's wedged between China and India. It has 30 million people in a small country. It's best known for the highest mountains in the world called Mount Everest. And yet little is known about the biodiversity in Nepal. They have some of the most iconic species in the world, Asian one-horned rhinos, Bengal tigers, Asian elephants, snow leopards, red pandas, river dolphins. With 30 million people, though, they live in close proximity to these iconic species. And so I went back to Nepal a year later, and I helped on a surgery with a tiger. And it brought a stark difference that I saw in the U.S. I had reliable electricity and transportation and clean running water. And yet in Nepal, we had none of that. This is a photograph of me and the head wildlife veterinarian in Nepal doing surgery on a critically endangered species on a tablecloth. There's no running water. There's no surgical theater, there's no hospital. But the one thing that Nepal has, which I haven't seen anywhere that I've worked, is the people are incredibly dedicated to their conservation and to their iconic species. And so then I had to say, wait a minute. I have to shift my career and I have to focus on this because this is lacking. And I asked the experts. I asked the experts in Nepal, and I asked the experts abroad. And I first went to the head wildlife veterinarian. There's one wildlife veterinarian for 20 protected areas of Nepal. And I asked him what did he need in order to help develop a wildlife health program? What was he lacking? And he said not only resources, not only the training for the people, but something that I found in the U.S., and that was a lack of attention and lack of funding for wildlife health in the field, in the wild, to help critically endangered species. And I met with the people that were doing the hard conservation work. This is a photograph of the research station for NTNC, National Trust for Nature Conservation. They're doing the hard work, and I said, hey, with the work that you're doing, how about adapting a wildlife health program? And they embraced it. They absolutely wanted it. And I met Dr. Gretchen Kaufman. She was a director of conservation medicine at Tufts University. She was a pioneer in wildlife health, and she knew a lot about the subject. She had worked in Nepal for 10 years in the vet school. And she joined forces with me and she's now my partner. And we formed a nonprofit organization called VIEW, Veterinary Initiative for Endangered Wildlife, because there is a void in conservation and there is a need to include wildlife health in conservation. And we formed this organization because of three reasons, the three needs, through training, infrastructure, and research. VIEW is the only organization in the world solely focused on endangered wildlife health. Yes, there are pockets of, of, of groups that are doing wildlife health, but not solely focused not only on addressing wildlife health, but making it a sustainable program within the country. So let's show you some of the things that we do. Now, endangered wildlife like this tiger 
some need to be immobilized sometimes for management purposes or for research. Management reasons because, let's say, a tiger goes out and, and kills a farmer's cow, or a grizzly bear needs a collar for a GPS collar to, to monitor his territory. And that's a wonderful time when that animal's sleeping to collect valuable information. Just a little blood gives us incredible amounts of information. We can not only look at disease in that animal, but we can also help the population by looking at diseases that that animal has been affected by. Other viruses. And so we not only help teach collecting biological samples, those incredibly valuable, valuable specimens, but we help on how do you immobilize an animal? Because a lot of work done internationally is just immobilizing an animal, but it's actually like doing anesthesia. And you have to monitor that animal because you're talking about critically endangered species. We've got to be really serious about being careful, keeping the right plane of anesthesia, making sure that they wake up, and then they can run away. And when an animal, an critically endangered animal like a rhino dies, not all is lost. There's valuable information in that. A gross postmortem examination can tell you something just looking at an animal that died, but most of the time it requires microscopes and more serious investigation. And so here I am teaching three wildlife veterinarians how to safely collect biological samples from a dead carcass. Not only collect those samples, but do it safely and be able to put it back into our field research lab. So here is our laboratory. We partnered with NTNC, Nature, National Trust for Nature Conservation. And that research station is right on the edge of Chitwan National Park. We have basic field laboratory equipment, but we have consistent electricity. Electricity now through solar panels so that when we get those samples, they're not all lost. Because when we started, they didn't have that. So there's no way to investigate for disease. And this is Dr. Amir Sudala, our veterinary fellow. And he's analyzing tuberculosis samples in an elephant. And these are wildlife students. We're very fortunate. The veterinary school is only 20 kilometers away from our laboratory. And we are constantly training. And we do workshops. We do workshops on chemical mobilization, safe capture techniques, and also on wildlife health. And here we are teaching about darting or tranquilizer gun. The man behind the table is Vishnu Lama. He has captured more tigers and rhinos on this planet. He's very knowledgeable, but he wants to retire. I want to be able to capture that be able to take his knowledge and teach 35 people in Nepal on wildlife health and wildlife conservation and to use that knowledge and then go on and teach other people. And we always like to include women. This is a veterinary student who completed our course. And we don't just do training. We also help with animals. Unfortunately, we've seen many, I've seen seven baby rhinos since I've been working there. This is a baby rhino who was out in the forest, and he was attacked by a tiger and abandoned by his mom. And he was really weak. I didn't think he was going to make it. But I used that opportunity not only to treat him and to treat him medically, but I use that opportunity to also train the wildlife veterinarians, to train the wildlife professionals on the ground on wound care management. And we write those protocols down. We don't lose that. So the next time a baby rhino comes in, we have information. How do you medically treat it? And then how do you feed a baby rhino? You can't just feed it cow's milk. If you feed it cow's milk, just like any baby animal, it needs the proper nutrition or it could die, or have long-term health effects. And so, 
we keep this on a database, on a computer, so that other wildlife professionals in Nepal can utilize that information. And we've had some new research discoveries. We had the question, canine distemper, which is shared with dogs, shared with wildlife, and it's shared with tigers. And we wanted to know, do dogs have this disease that live outside the park, outside of tiger habitat? And we found out that 27% of the dogs do carry antibodies to this deadly disease. But we also used that opportunity not only to do our own research, but we also brought with us, I had at least a dozen veterinary students every time I went into the field on those four strategic locations to look for the disease in the dogs, I brought with me veterinary students and trained them how to take blood. Because how to take blood from a dog, you can also know how to take blood from a tiger. And we also vaccinated hundreds of dogs around the park. And another thing that we learned with our partners in a very short period of time was that we found the first case of tuberculosis in a rhino. That's one of the first cases in endangered wildlife in Asia with a disease, and a disease so deadly. We share this disease. Tuberculosis complex is not only in wildlife, but we see it in agricultural animals, and we see it in people. 10 million people die a year due to tuberculosis. And in Nepal, they've done a really good job on conservation, on helping stop poaching. In the past three years, they've, they have had zero poaching, and yet, in the same time, 26 rhinos have died of unknown causes. That's two, 26 too many. Endangered wildlife no longer live in nature without the intrusion of people. Nepal is just a template. Tigers are just a template. They're an example. This needs to happen across species and across the world. We need to adapt wildlife health into our conservation package. Thank you.